From coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Captain Major Christian events in America and across the world, covering over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. Now from Miami, Florida, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Joining us on Praise the Lord, one of the most widely read Christian writers of this generation, Jenny Buckingham. Senior pastor of the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Dr. James Kennedy. Ministry to Music, Musical Evangelist, Steve Brock. Now your hosts, President and founders of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and Jane Post. Florida cheer. Is that a is that a rebel yell? A rebel yell. Y'all are rebels down here, aren't you? We are. Yes, we are. Step up into the light, he said. How y'all doing? Everybody happy? Yeah. We're just delighted to be down here in the beautiful Gold Coast of South Florida, Channel 45. Y'all be seated if you want to, and uh, we're just going to have church down here. We're just Happy to be back down here in this beautiful land of sunshine where it rains on you every day, but then the sun comes back out again. We had a nice little shower today, and uh, there just isn't much of a prettier place in the whole wide world than South Florida. We really love it down here. And now that we have Zacchaeus here parked permanently, in fact, we're building his garage out here, you know, right away, and it'll mean that any time... The spirit moves anytime something special comes along. We'll just be here anytime we can get Dr. James Kennedy and James Buckingham and all these wonderful friends that we can't hardly ever get out to California. Why, we'll be down here just to say hello and say we love you and just stay here as much as we can. Amen? Yes, happy Passover day, yes. everybody. Yes. It was a wonderful day for me. I, I just began to remember the things that, where God told the children of Israel exactly what the lamb that would take away the sins of the world would be like in their lamb that they used in the Passover dinner. And today I was just kind of remembering some of the things and thinking about it and tried to write them down. And just like Well, let's see. You want to talk about that just a little bit? Because it's so beautiful. Just some of the things that I could remember. You kind of set the... Well, I think anybody who, who knows the Lord and has, has done any reading in, in the Old Testament knows that Passover was that night that the death angel killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians. Moses had gone, you know, many times to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. They were in Egyptian bondage and Pharaoh wouldn't let them go and so they had the plague of frogs and lice and flies and all of the different, the ten plagues. And the last one, God told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh if he doesn't let your people go that the firstborn of every living creature will die tonight in all the land of Egypt. And the only protection you will have, you people of Israel who live down in the land of Goshen, is to kill a little lamb and take its blood and sprinkle it on the doorposts and the lentils of your house. And when that death angel passes through all of the land of Egypt and the firstborn from Pharaoh to the firstborn even of all the cattle will die. The protection for your firstborn children of Israel will be that blood that will be on the doorpost and the lentils of your house. Of course, if we had time, and maybe Dr. Kennedy will 
add a word later on. He, he is a, a walking encyclopedia on every subject under the sun. But the, the simple truth was that the firstborn of all of the people of Israel were spared that night as the death angel passed over every house that had the blood applied to its door, and they were safe. I love it. They were safe. And you know, it doesn't say anything except that the blood was just applied to the doorpost. It doesn't say they got good enough. It doesn't say they, you know, were perfect people. It was just that the blood of the Lamb was applied to the doorposts of their homes and they were all safe. And a few of the things that God said about the Lamb that each family was to, to get for their particular home was? These are the rules and regulations that the Jewish families have traditionally practiced all down through the centuries, through the many generations. And uh, I, I was really uh, amazed when I, when I saw some of the little things that they still practice today that point so perfectly, beautifully, and unmistakably toward the Lamb of God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who indeed was the fulfillment of all of this. The little lamb was simply a picture of that Lamb of God who would come someday into the future. And you remember the first thing that John the Baptist said when he came up, or when he first saw him coming to the waters of baptism, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. <laughs> but give us those little facts concerning that lamb. They're very fascinating. Interesting. So many of the things that God taught the Jewish people, this is what the lamb should be, was absolutely looking toward Jesus. First of all, the, la the lamb had to be the firstborn in the flock. It had to be the first son. Mm -hmm. The son, the it first son because it had to be a male lamb. It had to be without spot or wrinkle, without any spot. It had to be a perfect lamb. And this was so interesting. It had to be kept in the home of the Jewish family three days before it was slain. And the reason is they had to learn to love the lamb. They had to appreciate that this was the little lamb that was going to take away their sins for a whole year when it was slain. Yes. And that's so beautiful. Jesus, as we know, after he began his ministry, lived for three years among the people. Well, the little lamb was three days in the homes of the people before it was slain. And the whole family was involved in this. It involved everybody in the ceremony. And then, of course, the little lamb, and this is the most astonishing one, was slain always. God said, slay him at 3 in the afternoon, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And that's exactly when Jesus died on the cross. 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And then this was so interesting that inside the lamb, after he was prepared for roasting, was a cross was placed in his body. One, the long part held his body the long way, of course. And then they'd always put a crossbow in to hold his arm area open and chest area open. Made a perfect cross, wooden cross, was put in the little lamb's body before it was roasted. Just so many beautiful things that we know that pointed, of course, then the blood took away the sins of the family and the flesh then was eaten for health and life and strength in the family. Isn't that interesting how anybody cannot see that the Passover lamb that God prepared and told the children of Israel about so many years that Jesus became that lamb that took away the sins of the world. He did. And then, of course, you have to add that he was born in Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin. It was the royal line of David. And out of Egypt he came. And, and uh, just so many things you have to add 
that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. And today is a beautiful day just saying, Jesus, we love you. And thank you for taking away our sins. Thank you for healing. Thank you for the wonderful things that you've done for us. Steve, come on. Let's open this great night of praise with a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Because of Jesus, the death angel has passed over you. And he has passed over me. I have eternal life. And you can have eternal life too. Because of that Lamb of God. That perfect Lamb of God. Who finally came and gave his life. And shed his blood. That you and I might live forever. Don't you love him tonight? In a new way. And so we celebrate this great Passover season with this program tonight by returning our love and our thanks and our blessing to our Lamb, the Lamb of God. And you know what Steve's going to sing? He paid too much. much too much a price for me. That's the song he's going to sing. No problem at all. That's a great song. Much too high a price. What a great thing to consider and understand that the Lord God gave everything that we could have everything, life and life more abundantly. I'm born again, brother, because of that price, on my way to heaven because of that price, be reunited with my family because of that price. Isn't that exciting? Lead us in our prayer, Steve, and then sing that great song of praise. Father in heaven, we thank you because of your grace and your goodness and your mercy and your love. Thank you because of the joy of the Lord that is present in our midst even now. Thank you because you gave everything. I am a Christian because God so loved the world that he gave. All of my needs are supplied according to thy riches and glory because God gave. On my way to heaven because God gave. I can be healed because God gave. Hallelujah. My loved ones are born again and we are a family together in God because you gave your only begotten son, the son of the living God, savior of the world, king of kings, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. With all of my heart, we worship you. We praise you. We adore you. We, um, we magnify you and glorify your name for all the price that you paid for us. Giving your life that we could have it and we could enjoy the glorious freedom in this life. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God. Those of you that have needs, if you'd like to fill out one of the little slips, we'll agree with you and pray with you as we have prayer here several times tonight. Those of you viewing tonight, call the number on your screen. And there'll be a prayer partner there that'll love you and pray with you and agree with you for whatever you need. For whatever you need Hallelujah. has been purchased and paid for and provided. By Jesus Christ, that perfect Lamb of God. Sing it with Steve right now. That great song of praise and adoration. He paid much too high a price. Hallelujah. Worship the Lord with me, ladies and gentlemen. Here in the studio, across the network, just lift your hands and let's just praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Your love endured the cross, despising all the shame. The afternoon when midnight fell, your suffering clear my name. And that sin swept him and came and opened all to paradise because you paid so high, high a price. You paid much. To high a price for me, the tears 
everybody. Let's clap your hands and worship. Don't give up on the child of God. He'll be there when the battle's over. He will make it through the storm. Find his way through the darkness night. Don't give up on the child of God. He's the one who God is keeping. Don't give up. Don't give up on the child of God. 
for others. We don't need your sorrow. We are held by a mighty hand, the hand that holds tomorrow. The reason we have stood the test and woman every situation, standing on his mighty word, a mighty firm foundation. Don't give up on the child of God. He'll be there when the battle's over. He will make it through the storm. Find his way through the darkest night. And I don't give up on the child of God. He's the one who God is keeping. Don't give up. Don't give up on the child of God. Listen now. The reason why we smile when we are in affliction. We have more than human help. We know the great physician. We have stood through every test. And though the mountains are over every circumstance, Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't give up on the child of God. He'll be there when the battle's over. He will make it through the storm. Find his way through the darkest night. Oh, don't you give up on the child of God. He's the one who God is keeping. Don't give up. Don't give up on the child of God. Come on, everybody help me sing now. Don't you give up on the child of God. He'll be there when the battle's over. He will make it through the storm. Find his way through the darkest night. Jesus. Woo. Praise the Lord. He brought. Lord, Lord, Lord. I don't know about you all, but something about that song just reaches way down here somewhere and just gets me to where I want to sing almost. Oh, dear. <laughs> That'd be a terrible, that wouldn't would it? Be I mean, do you realize Jan and I literally used to sing specials oh, honey, in the church? Please. I mean, we really did. Oh, there will be a special oh, reward for some of those dear people who suffered <laughs> <laughs> under our singing. <laughs> you should be so glad the Lord called us to Christian television where we don't have to sing instead of, well, anyhow, how did I get into that? I'm so glad the Lord has sent Steve Bronk along and other great singers and musicians to bless us want you to say hello to a dear, dear friend, Dr. James Kennedy, from right here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Don't applaud yet. I want to introduce him properly. He is, this may be out of date, Jim, already, Senior Minister of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Fort Lauderdale, President and Founder of Evangelism Explosion International, equipping laymen for evangelism, including many of the fastest-growing churches of the world. He's also been a regular member of the faculty of the Billy Graham School of Evangelism author of several, several books, including Know Why You Believe and Truths That Transform and Why I Believe. It'd be kind of fun to touch on that maybe a little bit tonight, uh, Dr. Oh, Kennedy. Yes. If I, I mean, whatever you want to talk about is fine with me. You can also see uh, Dr. Kennedy's uh, television program right here on the entire Trinity Broadcasting Network Sundays. Well, here in South Florida, I think, Sundays at 8 a.m. and Tuesdays at 4 p.m. From right, and I've got some good news for him I'm going to share in just a minute, but let's welcome Dr. James Kennedy. How you doing, Jim? Thank you. Paul, welcome. good to be back. Good to have you. I, um, I wasn't sure that I was going to make it tonight. I-95 was... Uh, it was really coming down. It, I have not seen, I hate to say this, on television from South Florida, and I hope the Chamber of Commerce will forgive me, but it was raining today in South Florida. Really? Oh, I yes. mean, it was, it was so bad, 
I drove along and I saw somebody lying by the side of the road. They had obviously drowned. My Lord. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was Kermit. <laughs> I mean, it was a real frog strangler. <laughs> you had me worried there for a minute. <laughs> You were being a good Samaritan, the reason you were I didn't late. think anybody would be here. I can't imagine. I started to go back and get the ark, but... Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know it was raining. I didn't oh, realize it was raining. It outside. really was. You were inside today. Yes, so I'm really glad we all made it. Yeah. Safe and sound. Well, glad to have you here. Listen, I got some wonderful news good. for you. Tell me. The South African government has finally authorized a full Christian network. Wonderful. For the whole Republic of South Africa. Wonderful. I have the draft of the agreement, the first draft, on my desk upstairs. And you're going to do it. We're going to do it. Hey, We're going to do it. You and do you know how I got them to, one of the reasons I got them to agree? How was that? They would have never let a crazy old Pentecostal like me <laughs> on over there. I told them I was going to put Dr. James Kennedy's program on over Wonderful. there. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. And Dr. Robert Schuler. Wonderful. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Who's the great Baptist pastor from Atlanta, Dr. Uh, Charles, St Stanley. Charles Stanley, and uh, Dr. And I didn't tell him about Shambach yet. I, I, I told him E.V. Hill. No, seriously, they have commissioned us to put together a a, a religious channel, a religious I think network that's great. for S mm -hmm. South Africa, and uh, I indeed will be in touch with you at the appropriate time to get your program transferred into the. Uh, the PAL system and uh, well, we already are in PAL on your station, which is and down there at Siskai. Siskai. We'll mm -hmm. just send that tape. Sure. Up. Send yes, it over. you won't even have to send the next there tape. You go. So All that's set. good news that you can share well, with the Well, I'm delighted to hear that. And Marvelous. the entire country will be bathed with a whole, not just another station, but we're talking a network. The Lord has just birthed a whole network. I think that's incredible, and uh, Paul and Jan, I never cease to be amazed every time I come here to, to see what the Lord is uh, doing and spreading your ministry farther and farther abroad. Well, it's all of our ministries together. It's the body of Christ really working together, and we're just so delighted to see it happening. China now is, is on. Of course, Nora Lamb is on every week now. They're relaxing more and more the, our ability to even preach is that right? uh, the gospel. They've, they've invited me to come New Year's Eve and literally preach at the big Three Self Church in Beijing, Marvelous. and the walls are Wonderful. coming down over there. Uh, let's see, what is it? What's the my other good news? Is being this gospel in the whole world. is being <laughs> preached in all the Amen. world. Gay went to Beijing and preached, and 192 million people came forward. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but uh, good happen. Let me say, yes, sir. Well, so what's happening up at Coral Ridge? I know you've always got a uh, Last time you were in a mess up there. You were building something. and uh, Well, we're not out of the mess yet, uh, but it's a little bit better. We hope to be through with that in July. We'll hold large additions to the church. And as I mentioned uh, last time, we have launched a new project to start into making major Hollywood motion pictures of a Christian sort with Christian values and morals and I themes. I want to know all about that. And that's encouraging. We uh, have the team all put together, and we have some real experts. Some uh, people have difficulty understanding that somebody said to me, well, are you going to play yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, no. Uh, they said, well, who's going to play you? I said, nobody. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, who are you going to play? <laughs> and I said, nobody. <laughs> I'm not going to be in it. Not about me. We're making pictures about... Uh, all sorts of things. Many things, yes. Uh, with, uh, we've taken sort of chariots of fire as a <laughs> exemplar of something, the mm -hmm. type of picture that we hope mm -hmm. to make that will have general audience appeal and yet can get a Christian message across and Good. do it in a way that the whole family can go to see it. I think the time has come. Oh, people are really disgusted with what's coming out. Even many of the people in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. We have a group of, uh, I remember I, I said that to a reporter one time, and uh, he thought I was talking about films for Sunday school. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, no, films for the theater. And he laughed. Oh, really? And, well, I thought, uh, we'll have to do a little bit about that. So I said, well, we have on our team, we have Howard Kassangian, uh, his as producer. His last three films grossed over $800 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He sort of gulped and uh, <laughs> stopped laughing very quickly at that point. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, 
Orrin Worsley, who was the production manager for E.T., the all-time highest grossing picture in the history of Hollywood. <coughs> Al Kasha, who was a converted Jew. who we know uh, him, yes. Uh, as you know, he's won several, two Academy Awards. Five. Uh, yes. Well, Grammys. last time I talked to him, he had two. <laughs> maybe he's Grammys. got three more. Maybe he's some, some Grammys yeah, as uh -huh. well, but two Academy Awards. He did the Poseidon Adventure and mm -hmm. the score for, uh, what was the other one? Three. Hmm. I can't remember. But uh, he's been a guest on Praise the Lord. Uh, uh -huh. we, we enjoyed his Yes, he's a testimony. fascinating yeah. In fascinating fact, he man. was saved, Dr. Kennedy, watching Channel 40. Is that right? And he happened to be watching Robert Schuller at the time. That's right. But that's he told me that. how he received Jesus, is right. he watching Channel 40. So uh, we're excited to see uh, what the Lord's going to do with that. Do you have any Id ideas as to some of the themes you'll deal with? Or well, some of the we've stories been through or? probably 50 scripts already, and people are sending them in uh, like do, coupons. Do you want any more? Or? <laughs> well, they're good ones. And we're down to about four or five that we're looking at seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not quite at liberty yet to sure. say what they are. Every time you, every time it seems to me, I don't know anything about Hollywood, but the people out there says any time say that any time you say you've got a really great story idea and you let it out then before you get your picture made they've stolen it and put yeah. out somebody else has put out a picture on no, the same yeah. theme that's happened a number of times yeah. so we can't say that but we have some really great in fact, we've got five scripts all five of them would make great motion pictures and we hope to be able to make uh, a whole series of films so what do you all think is it time for us to have Christian Films, motion pictures, I mean, in the theater. Uh, you know, just, I don't know if it's by coincidence or just that the Holy Spirit's kind of moving in this, in this way right now, but we're working with Nora Lamb, you know, and we are producing her story in, in, in a major motion picture. No, um, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Um, Jim, Collier. Jim Collier, who wrote, directed, and produced Corey Ten Boom's story, The yes, Hiding Place. Uh -huh. Is, is doing the uh, script and may even go on and direct it. And we're, we're working on the staffing right now. But this will be a major motion picture, and we're going to do it in a way that will get it into, into major motion picture theaters. And, uh, well, I think that's fantastic. And I hope that many other Christian groups and Christian artists will move in. You know, we, we retreated uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. We retreated from from motion pictures and we retreated from education and higher education. We retreated from the government, we television. retreated from television <laughs> and uh, everything and we left it to the unbelieving world and they rushed in, took over and they've produced this ungodly, secular, anti-Christian culture that we're having to live with. So I think it's time to quit going on the defense and uh, go on the offense for a time. Quit cursing the darkness and right. light a candle, as someone that's once said. the <laughs> line that I have used a number of times, yeah, right? Yes, sir. So that's exciting. Another thing that uh, we are doing, I mentioned to you, it was just brand new last time I was here. When it wasn't even official, hadn't even been approved. But now it has been approved. We are, uh, have already voted to establish the Knox, John Knox Theological Seminary in Fort Lauderdale. Really? Uh, we have issued calls for the first uh, administrators, librarians, and staff, and uh, we hope to open the doors uh, a year from this September. Really? This will be a major theological oh, yes. seminary. Oh, it? yes. Very major. <laughs> and uh, we felt that we have a lot of distinctives that we feel people will be interested in. We want to have a very strong academic program combined with a very strong practical program. And there are a number of things that we have in our favor, and I won't mention them in order of importance, but South Florida is a nicer, nicer place to go to school than North Dakota. No <laughs> offense to those folks yeah. watching in North Dakota, but I think most people might feel that way. So that's one advantage. Uh, here is the home of Evangelism Explosion International. Mm -hmm. They will learn how mm -hmm. to witness and train their people to be uh, witnesses for Jesus Christ. Uh, they will have the opportunity of learning media we're talking about educating for the 21st century, and that mm -hmm. has got to include uh, knowledge and expertise in the media. We're building large uh, television studios and production facilities, something like you have here. And uh, we hope to train them in that and in radio. We have a radio station, a large church, 
a Christian school, and all of these things that they will have the opportunity to learn firsthand, get hands-on experience in doing. So we're really excited about that. Whew, man, it sounds like good things are happening up at Coral Ridge as well. Is, is there anything kind of specially... Well, uh, wait, I just want to ask, are you taking applications for students? Oh, already? yes. They uh, can uh, write us uh, today, and uh, we don't start for a year, but uh, now's the time. People are thinking about seminary, write to me, and we'll be glad to... Uh, send you information. And they can get credit, I mean it'll be accredited? Oh yes, as right soon as, yes, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get it accredited uh, probably in relationship with some, some other school to begin with, but then accredited on our own. Mm -hmm. as soon as, you can't get accredited instantly. No. What's no. the name of it? John Knox. John Knox. John Knox, of course, was a great reformer of mm -hmm. Scotland, mm -hmm. and uh, he totally transformed the nation of Scotland. Many people remember him. He is the one who, who was overheard on his knees in a garden outside the church where he preached, praying vehemently, Oh God, give me Scotland mm -hmm. or I die. Mm -hmm. And God gave him Scotland. Mm -hmm. Scotland was the most debased, debauched, ungodly, superstitious, immoral country in all of Europe when Knox began his ministry. Really? And he totally transformed it until s the Scottish people are not considered it. That sounds alien. You don't think mm -hmm. of Scotsmen in that way today, but that's the way it was, and God gave it to him, and there was an enormous revival in that country. If, uh, now, f do I understand that people would need to have their undergraduate work already yes. completed? Yes. This would be... This is a graduate seminary like any of the other seminaries, okay. right? Now, we are going to have classes for lay people. We'll have regular classes for people to be ordained to the ministry. We'll have graduate classes for ministers who want to go on to uh, an advanced degree, and we'll have classes for lay people who can come and study the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, or theology, or church history, or... Any music any. courses? Ah, ah. yes. Thank we're you. also going to have, I, I'm glad ah. you mentioned that, connected with it will be a graduate school mm. of church music. Ah. So we will have people there. And there'll be a crossover because uh, church musicians in, in, in those school conservatories have to take Bible and mm -hmm. church history and theology, mm -hmm. so they'll... And ministers have to take a course in church music, too. They should write to? They can write to me, uh, James Kennedy, at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale. Box 40? 40. Well, they could just write it to <laughs> Box 40. That'll be good. Uh, get to it. James Kennedy, Box 40, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. That'll do it. We'll see if we can't get that up on the uh, character generator okay. in a little and bit. And I'm for glad you named it John Knox and not James Kennedy Bible School. <laughs> no, there, there is That's safe. He's dead. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> bad. Tech. Bad. Uh, bad. Well, well that, I, you know, I agree with that. I'm <laughs> glad you said that. Let there's, me tell nothing, you. there's nothing up there named James Kennedy. <laughs> let, let me tell you what Dr. Uh, E.V. Hill yeah. said. He was... Pastor Hill, Pastor I know Mount Zion yeah, Missionary sure. Baptist Church, he, he was developing this big uh, feeding program and, and uh, helps kitchen, and he was going to call it the pastor's kitchen, <laughs> feeding homeless mm -hmm. and hungry people, and oh, what a work he's doing oh. in Los Angeles, uh -huh. right? it's wonderful. He said one night in the middle of the night, he just got to thinking about that and said, if I call that the pastor's kitchen... I might have to support it. I think I'm going to call it the Lord's Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so he changed the name to the Lord's Kitchen instead of the pastor's kitchen. Well, you know, um, we, our tower in our church, people have said that looks like a rocket uh, getting ready to take mm -hmm. off. And mm -hmm. so somebody wanted to call our church the Kennedy, Kennedy. Space Center. <laughs> 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 and we're building a huge uh, fellowship hall that seats a thousand people at dinner, and we'll be having some dramas and things there on the stage, a different kind of artistic things. And it was suggested we could call that the Kennedy Center, Center for Performing <laughs> Arts. <laughs> yes, yes. But no, not a taken. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's I the said truth. no. We named TBN Trinity. We there figured they could handle it. We couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I would like to do sometime, uh, Dr. Kennedy, is wh when you have some really big super-duper extravaganza up there, as you often do, we now have the Holy Beamer here that can send it to the satellite, and we ought to just come sometime Fantastic. and have live Kennedy whatever. Good. Uh, Come and bring, bring yourselves, too. We'll, We'd, we, you we'll do that. We would love to do that sometime. Is, is there anything really uh, special burning in your soul that you'd like to get into tonight? Or uh, I, I, if you don't, I do. All right. Well, what do you have in mind? <laughs> well, uh, 
the many books that you've written, I, I think a couple that have, have really meant a lot to me, and I haven't read them thoroughly as I ought, but I have read in them, Know Why You Believe mm -hmm. and... Uh, why I Believe. And Why I Believe. Know Why You Believe and Why I Believe. Mm -hmm. I think most of us, if we'll be real honest, even though those of us who grew up in a, in a wonderful Christian home, my, my parents were pastors and missionaries to Egypt, and I, my earliest memories were uh, of Egypt, and I, I thank God for the heritage. But it seems like almost everybody, when they get into those teen years, they go through a stage, uh, I don't know what it is, rebellion, craziness. I went into a period of, of really questioning, and I'm afraid doubting even the the fundamental truths and principles that I had been taught as a child in Sunday school on, on the way up. And so it drove me into a study of the Word of God, and I found, to my delight and my amazement in some cases, nuggets of truth tucked away in that Bible that absolutely settled it for me, that, that I could hang my eternal salvation on that Word of God. I know you've touched on this. For example, I, one, of the, one of the astounding truths that I discovered in the book of Job was that, you know, all contemporary writers right on up through Columbus thought that the earth was flat and he, he was going to sail off the edge of the earth in 1492. Mm -hmm. It is God who sitteth upon the circle, or the, it's literally the sphere, sphere of the earth. That's right. And I mean, when you go back and you read contemporary writings of literature that came from Job's time, today it is so hopelessly, as you know, yeah. out of date with contemporary scientific discovery till it's actually funny. It's, it's ludicrous. It's laughable. But not the Bible. And, and Job and is probably the oldest book in the Bible. <coughs> we believe it is, yes. Which uh, is even more incredible. And all sorts of scientific facts are stated in the book of Job. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I told you in a previous program what prompted me to write that book or not. If I did, probably they've forgotten it Please anyway. tell us again. But uh, I was at home one night and somebody called me up and said, you've got to turn on such and such a radio station because there's an atheist on there who is eating Christians a lot. <laughs> so I turned on the radio and there was some fellow on one of these talk shows down here and uh, Christians were calling up and they were saying, oh, but Dr. So-and-so, don't you believe in the Bible? And he did the same thing to everybody that called. He said, of course not. That's a bunch of fairy tales and myths. Do you believe in the Bible? They said, oh, yes, sir. And he said, why? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And he did, don't you believe in God? No, I don't. Do you? Yes. Why? And don't you believe in the resurrection? No. Do you? Yes. Why? He said that over and over. Why? Do you believe? And I was dialing this number over and over again for an hour and a half. I, list, I walked paced back and forth, <laughs> listening to this radio, trying to get through, and not one single Christian gave one mm. it, answer of any sort as to why they believed anything. Mm. And I was so distraught that when I finally got through uh, to the station, my heart started pounding. I'd been working so hard to get it. <laughs> And they said, I'm sorry, our time is no, up. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I stayed awake most of the night. I was so upset about that. And I preached, I decided to preach. I preached for six months or so <laughs> on why I believe in everything. <laughs> yes, good, good. And uh, when I got through, I got a call from another radio station, another disc jockey or whatever they are, talk show host. And he said, I'm going to have a debate between an atheist and a Christian minister. Would you be the minister? And I said, well, who is the atheist? Uh-oh. And it was this fellow. Ah. Oh, <laughs> bullseye. Oh, I tried to not get too excited. And I, <clears throat> I said, well, I'll have to check my calendar to see if I have any appointment. And I didn't care what I had on my calendar. I was going to clear it for him. And so I went down to the studio and I spent three hours in a little tiny room about half the size of this platform with this man. I had spent six months preparing <laughs> to meet him. And preaching on it. Yeah. 
And, you know, I mean, he thought he got hit by the charge of the Light Brigade that night. <laughs> <laughs> but what were some of the things you, you got into on that broadcast? Oh, we got into, is the Bible the Word of God? And uh, we got into things like uh, evolution. And uh, he, he, the Lord really prepared me. And he really did not know much. He was a little bit of a skillful debater in that he could turn these questions on these Christians, but he wasn't really smart. <laughs> he, did, he didn't know much about the Bible or mm -hmm. theology at all. And uh, so he brings up evolution as this... Uh, fact and we talked about that for a half hour or so on the time and I thought it was at the end no during the program after that he said well to the host he said why don't you schedule a whole evening where Dr. Kennedy and I could debate evolution and the host said and the host who wasn't really at all uh, necessarily favorable to my position but after what he'd heard for the last half hour he said you've got to be kidding <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you won the debate then. Well, that, that was, of all the debates I've ever had, that was, I think, the most one-sided one I've ever seen. Who, uh, we, I want to come back to this subject, but who are some of the... Uh, have you ever debated, like, Madeleine Murray O'Hare or any of the other uh, famous... Uh, I haven't uh, debated Madeleine Murray O'Hare, and uh, I really don't care to debate Madeleine Murray O'Hare, and not because that she is particularly knowledgeable, but she... I've talked to people who have debated her, and uh, she is so uncouth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Like I, I talked to the um, pastor of First Baptist Dallas. Uh, oh yes, Chris Dr. Chris Dr. Criswell, Dr. Criswell, very distinguished gentleman. He was on a debate with her on television. And every time they'd break for a commercial, she he she would turn. He said, and make some of the most obscene comments I heard that. Uh, about to this man that when the camera came back on he he was sitting there with his <laughs> mouth open he'd, ne he'd never heard such language as this before this yeah. and I mean that type of thing I don't I uh, was in a debate on the McNeil Lira report with Stephen Jay Gould of mm -hmm. Harvard who is considered the leading evolutionist uh, in America today and that was interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Where and a number of I've debated a lot of people, of course. Where where do you begin with maybe a freshman class of of of, of younger people who who have honest doubts and questions about all of the things that we've been taught from our youth up uh, about the Word, about the Bible, about God, about creation, about this? Where where do you begin? Well, if they if they really have sincere doubts about uh, the scripture, like I had a new member class that I taught Sunday night, and uh, one young lady asked the question, how do you know that the Bible is the word of God? Good question. And uh, many people are confused about that. And I, th I suppose that many people feel that you all have some predilection to believe it. You just sort of lean that way. Uh, like some people like turnips or whatever. <laughs> you believe the word of God. Uh, and I said, well, you know, the Bible tells us, God tells us how we can know if the Bible or any other book is the Word of God. He says, hereby you shall know if a prophet has been sent by me. If what he foretells comes to pass, then you will know that I have sent him. If it does not, then fear him not, for I have not sent him. So there you have the test, the test of specific predictive prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, there are 26 volumes in the world like the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, or the writings of uh, Buddha, whatever, mm -hmm. that either claim themselves to be, in many cases they don't, but others claim them to be a revelation from God. But uh, it's interesting that only the Bible contains specific predictive prophecies that have come to pass. Mm -hmm. And the Old Testament contains over 2,000 specific prophecies that have already come to pass. They don't exist in any other of the writings of these various religions. And if anybody would really take the time to do their own investigatory, you, you could prove that, couldn't you? you? Oh, Beyond absolutely. the shadow you of any doubt. You did it in your book? Oh, yes. You did yes. it in your book. In the book, Why I Believe, I examine many of those prophecies. I don't examine all 2,000 of them. 
Uh, as you know, 333 of them have to do with the coming of Christ. Uh, Nostradamus is famous for his so-called prophecy concerning his Hitler, whom he calls Hitler. And uh, but there is no, there are no details concerning the man. Suppose there were that there were only one prophecy in the Old Testament concerning Christ. It would be laughed out of court. Yet Nostradamus has become famous for that. Yeah. There are 333. There is nothing like this in any other book in the world about any other person in the world. Nothing vaguely within light years of approaching this. And that's only 333 of those. Uh, I think one interesting one that your viewers may be interested in uh, pertains to these are things that are big. You can, you can examine them. You can historically verify them. Pertains to the walls of Babylon. Uh, the prophet, when Babylon was the greatest city in the world, said that the walls, the broad walls of Babylon would be totally destroyed mm -hmm. and never be built again. Well, the walls of Babylon were 300 feet high and 187 and a half feet thick. That is, those are enormous walls they're as high as the, the tower and steeple in front of our church and wider than, than our church is long. You can imagine the mm. size of those walls. And they were almost 60 miles in circumference. Mm. 60 miles of walls. Mercy. And he said they would be totally destroyed. Well, Babylon was taken by the Persians without destroying the walls at all. They came in under the river. Okay. And later in other wars, part of the walls were breached, very small amount of them. And the city, the population moved away from the city later over the centuries. But the walls of Babylon still jutted into the sky, a mute testimony to the fact that the prophecy had not been fulfilled. But the prophet died, was long moldering in his grave. The Old Testament concluded in 400 BC. It was translated into Greek in the Septuagint and no later than 150 BC. There's no one in the world who can say that that prophecy was written after, after the event. Death. Christ uh -huh. lived and died and rose again. The walls are still standing. There's no way you can say that this was history pawned off as prophecy, which they like to say. And what happened? Well, in the 400s, uh, after Rome had become a Christian empire, Julian the Apostate came to the throne. He wanted to restore the ancient pagan religions. He studied the Bible in order to disprove it. But like so many people, he didn't study it well enough. I remember John Murray, who is Madeleine Murray O'Hare's son, mm -hmm. uh, of the famous take prayer out of the schools case. And he wasn't interested in doing that, but his mother was. Mm -hmm. He told me when he was at our house for dinner one time that his mother told him that the Bible obviously was foolishness because it said that the ark of Noah was covered with gold. Gold? Gold. Now, anybody, she said, half, anybody who was half a, with half a brain would know that if you covered a ship with gold, it wouldn't float. The ark was covered with gold. <laughs> well, now, of course, the Bible says that the ark was covered with gold. But it was the ark of the covenant, oh. not the ark <laughs> of Noah, yeah, which yeah. was covered with pitch. Oh. And so she got that mixed up. And he didn't study the Bible much better. <laughs> the one day, Julian the Apostate, Emperor of Rome, was fighting a war with the Persians at the site of what of the desolated city of Babylon. But most of the walls remained. The Persian armies went up on top of them. They rained arrows down on the Romans, killed thousands of Roman soldiers. Finally, the Romans conquered the Persians. And then Julian the Apostate, who was out to destroy the scriptures as a revelation from God, gave an order to his troops destroy these walls, <laughs> that no one can use them against us anymore. And with a prodigious labor over a long period, the Roman army <laughs> tore down the walls of Babylon so that when in modern times it was found, they had to dig down to find it. And he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Right. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh, I think there's a little <laughs> poetic justice that he was the one God used yeah. to fulfill prophecy. Precisely. You, you know, speaking of Babylon, and, and oh, there's so many others, that, and we've got time for a few more. Um, I have heard and seen some writings that uh, Babylon is in the modern country of Iraq, isn't it? Yes. And uh, 
it's built the it same. back up. Who's, who is the who is the top leader over in Iraq? Uh, Hussein, isn't it, or yes. Hassam, or yeah. something like yeah, that? Uh, is actually planning and is rebuilding the city, ancient city of Babylon. <coughs> Have you heard that? Yes. Uh huh. They are trying to do that. Alexander the Great tried to do that. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Alexander the Great ruled the whole world. He made decided to make Babylon the world headquarters of his empire. He gave, he issued 600,000 rations to his soldiers and gave the command to rebuild the walls of Babylon. And he died in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. at age of 33. And it didn't happen. So uh, it'll be very, they're, they're having, I believe the Japanese are involved in this project of trying to do that. It'll be very interesting to see uh, how, how they succeed. How that comes along, And yes. it's interesting that uh, the land uh, has been rendered permanently infertile by the niter that is in the bricks, which is now all in the soil. And what was once an extremely fertile area has now been uh, ruined by really? what was in the bricks, which is now spread all, all over everywhere. Because there is a specific prophecy, I believe in where, Jeremiah or somewhere, that says that Babylon will never be rebuilt yes. again mm -hmm. and will never be inhabited and it will be a place where the owls and the jackals right. howl and, and so forth. So, um, as I have a picture of Babylon taken a few years ago, and it's very interesting. It looks like uh, the Grim Reaper took his scythe, and this is a picture taken from up in the air. Keep in mind, this, this city was uh, 56 miles around in, in circumference, and uh, it's an enormous, enormous city. It looks, all the buildings are cut off about that high, jagged, but they're all, looks like a atomic bomb blew up above it and blew up most of the, here you can see all of the outline of these thousands and thousands of houses and buildings and everything, and they're all about that high. Mm -hmm. It is a picture of utter desolation. Thanks to the Romans, huh? Uh, <coughs> well, they destroyed the wall, but uh, I'm not sure what uh, time probably had a big part <coughs> in destroying the houses as well. But uh, it's also an incredible, uh, awful. The temperature there now is very up 120. In oh. fact, it was so bad that uh, a few years ago I wanted to go there and the government there was not allowing tourists to go there because it was so dangerous to their health. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, fulfilled prophecy. I mean, we could spend the whole evening <coughs> on that. I mean, uh, one more that uh, comes to mind Micah 5.2, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little amongst the princes of Israel, yet out of thee shall come he who is to become ruler. Uh, the Bible literally predicted the town from which Christ would be, would be born. There, there are score, how many did you say altogether? Of Christ, two, uh, 333 of everything in the Old Testament. Prophecies in the Old Testament that have already been fulfilled is over 2,000. Over 2,000. 2,000. Fulfilled prophecy, certainly one of the important ways that we know that this Bible that we place our very lives and our faith upon is, is, is truly the Word of God. What are some of the other ways you deal with in, in, in your book? The, the Bible in Christianity is the only historical evidential religion in the world. Um, it's based upon historical facts which are supported by evidence, as opposed, let's say, to Buddhism. Buddhism is an idea. It is a psychological, religio, ethical idea. Gautama sat down under a tree, thought about the plight of man, and had an idea. Mm -hmm. Men suffer because they are miserable. They're miserable because they want things they can't get, so the thing to do is to kill desire, and then people won't be miserable anymore. That's the <laughs> essence of that. Yes. Kill the horse. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's an idea. It could be invented by anybody at any time. And you can, you can choose it or you can reject it, but it's not based upon evidence of that fact. Whereas the Bible is based upon evidence that Christ lived and he was born, he died, he rose again from the dead. Mm -hmm. Many people think that Christianity is based upon the teachings of Jesus. Mm. But that's not true. It's based ultimately upon the life of Christ. In fact, the Apostles' Creed 
Notice the, the emphasis that the Apostles' Creed gives to the, to the teaching, to the example, to the preaching of Jesus. It says he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried the third day he rose from the dead. His entire life is glossed over. Mm-hmm. goes from his first day to his last day. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not that there is no value in the teaching and preaching of Christ. There certainly is. But the ultimate salvation of man rests upon what you were talking about, that God set him to, sent him to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And uh, so Christianity being a historical religion, it is based upon the fact that Christ came, that he suffered and died and rose again from the dead. So we can not only go to the prophecies, but we can go to the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Mm -hmm, Christ mm -hmm. from the dead. Now, if you take almost any history, secular history, Western civilization, and I've looked at a number of them, uh, take even someone um, like H.G. Wells, the science fiction writer, he was also a historian, Mm -hmm. and he wrote Outlines of History. And in there, of course, he deals with the life of Christ. And he said Jesus Christ was born, he lived this life, he speaks highly of him, though he was not a believer by any means. And uh, then, he, then he was crucified and he died. That's the end of a chapter. Now, the next chapter says that somehow it began to be rumored abroad that Jesus rose from the dead. And this rumor was picked up by the apostles, first one and then another. They began to share it with other people and they picked it up and they began to talk, tell it to other people. And first thing you know, Christianity. Mm-hmm. All these people were believing. Now, of course, it never occurred to anybody to go out and look in the tomb. <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, just a few hundred yards away. Nobody ever thought of going and looking to see if he, was, <laughs> if he were still there. Uh, but this is the idea. They have, to, they have to agree that Christianity began when the apostles began to preach that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So about 30 A.D., in the city of Jerusalem, in Judea, the apostles, these apostles of Christ, began to proclaim that Christ rose from the dead. Now that is a historical fact. That is not really denied by any historians. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we have that much in agreement. Now the question is, why did they do this? And there are only a certain number of possibilities, three in fact. One is they were trying to deceive people. Mm-hmm. They were bent on deceiving people into thinking it was true for some reason, either that, that they were going to in some way profit from this or they were going to become famous or they were idealistic and they were going to, going to write a book, d- deceive the world into <laughs> morality. Uh, for whatever reason, they were deceivers. The second reason is possibility is that they were deceived. Mm-hmm. And they thought they had deceived. They wanted to see him so much they thought they saw him. Or well, they saw something over there in the darkness and they assumed that was Jesus. And so they just launched out all over the world telling people Christ rose from the dead. Uh, They were deceived, deceivers, or they were deceived, or they were indeed telling the truth. And these are really the only three possibilities that you have. Now, if you look at the first one, that they were themselves deceivers, you run immediately into a very, very insuperable problem. And that is, all of them but John gave their lives Mm. for what they said. And any psychologist or psychiatrist, and I've asked many myself just to verify it, will tell you that there's no record of anybody who's ever been willing to give his life for what he knew to be a fraud. Mm -hmm. Now, people may die for things that are untrue, but they don't know it. They They, they think they They are. They think that it's true. Now, that happens not infrequently. But if people know it's a fraud and they're running some sort of a scam, by the time you pile up the faggots and tie them to the stake and come up with a torch, they say, okay, fellas, uh, game's up. Uh, I was only kidding. I didn't mean it. You're right. He didn't. He's buried in the rose garden, Uh, whatever it may be. So here are these people. And I used to wonder why did virtually all of the apostles and also many of these early Christians that saw Christ why did they seal their testimony with their blood? And by that, Christ establishes church on a rock that cannot be moved. Now, as far as being deceived is concerned, we all agree that any one of us can be deceived. Uh, I've seen magicians do things that are obviously impossible, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have been deceived by them, as we all have. 
but there are certain things about which we cannot be deceived. Um, for example, you might watch a magician do something on the stage which would totally baffle you and he would deceive you as he's intending to do. But how long would I have to talk to you to convince you that Jan does not and never has existed? That she's like <laughs> Harvey's rabbit. She doesn't really exist. See, I mean, you, you have a relationship with her that you don't have with the magician and with his assistants and props up on the stage. Yeah. You have handled her, you have touched her, you have seen her. That which we have seen and heard and handled, we declare unto you of the word of life that ye also might have fellowship with us. Mm -hmm. So nobody could te tell me that my wife or my daughter doesn't exist. They could talk until they drop dead mm -hmm. of talking, and I would not be convinced. Mm -hmm. And so this is the way it was with Christ. They saw him, they handled him, they were with him, and uh, they put their finger in the nail prints in his hand, the hand in his side, and uh, they believed. They believed enough that they were willing to give their lives for it. So the nature of the evidence precludes their being deceived. So since they were not deceivers, since they shed their blood, and they were not deceived because of the nature of the evidence, the only reasonable mm -hmm. conclusion is that they were telling what was in fact the truth, the truth. that Jesus Christ oh, did rise from yeah, the dead. Yeah. Now, that is a very powerful argument, and you have <coughs> people like um, uh, Greenleaf, uh, Simon, Greenleaf, Simon Greenleaf. Greenleaf, you know the Greenleaf School of Law out in Southern California. Yes, sir. Uh, Simon Greenleaf was the Royal Professor of Law at Harvard, turn of the century and uh, the greatest authority on legal evidences in the history of the world. He, a Jew, an unbeliever, a hostile witness, uh, was forced to examine the evidences for the resurrection of Christ, and when he did it, he concluded that if the evidence for the resurrection of Christ were presented before any unbiased jury in the world, they would conclude that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. This same thing was true of Greenleaf, it was true of Lord Darling, who was the highest, uh, the Attorney General, so to speak, of Great Britain, and many and many another person of that caliber has examined the evidence and concluded that it is absolutely true. It is irrefutable, mm -hmm. and uh, the only thing is people don't examine the evidence, mm -hmm. and when they do, like yourself, mm -hmm. they are con convinced. Are you all taking notes on this out there? Have you learned a little something? You know, the Bible, tell, Paul tells us that we should be prepared at any time to give a reason for the hope that is within us. And I'm afraid too many of us, Dr. Kennedy, are like those people you heard on the radio. They're just, we just, we just believe and, and we don't have any real solid evidence or reasons or whatever to, to back up what we believe. And when we run into a skeptic, we don't know how to, to talk to them. Yeah. And when we run into some really difficult times ourselves, we may be looking for some, some rock, some solid place where we yeah. know this is true oh, and that uh, it's not just all in my mind or something like that, that they have something solid to hold on to. Why know why you believe and why I believe. Very similar titles. Yes. What's the difference? In well, the two? Know Why You Believe was just a couple of uh, uh, booklets that we produced on television. Why I Believe is a full-size book that was uh, published by a publishing house. Any and other um, fulfilled prophecy? Uh, resurrection. The resurrection of Christ. That, uh, I always <laughs> love to get into that because, of course, that is the, the key for the whole Christian faith right. and belief. If you can't believe the uh, resurrection, you're out of luck. Now, either one of those things that we've just mentioned, we talked about less than 1% of the totality. You could go on for hours and hours on any, either one of those. Yeah. We're talking about different categories. Another category, of course, is the fact that the, the, the teachings of Scripture and the events of Scripture have been verified by archaeology. And uh, this, it was believed when archaeology began back around uh, 1800 that uh, the archaeologists were going to disprove the scripture. It's interesting that archaeology set out to disprove the scripture and ended up providing one of the great confirmations of it. 
as uh, Glick, one of the great archaeologists of the last hundred years, uh, said that there has not been one statement of scripture that has ever been contradicted by mm. the finds of archaeology. <laughs> and uh, also higher criticism of the scripture uh, started out as a concerted attempt to, dis to destroy the reliability of scripture, the German higher criticism, the rational criticism. Mm -hmm. And somebody said that never did an elephant labor so hard and so long to produce a mouse. <laughs> and what they did produce was the fact that the text of the Bible uh, has been established by, on scientific grounds more than any other book. We know more certainly what the New Testament said than we do any other book in antiquity. And if we threw out the New Testament, you would have to throw out every mm -hmm. ancient writing mm -hmm. whatsoever because we know like a hundred times over the New Testament is actually what it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, archaeology has established these things throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, there was a, a famous archaeologist by the name of William Ramsey, maybe a name you might have heard of. Yeah. He was uh, the child of some atheists. He grew up as an atheist in England. He went to Oxford. He had his doctorate from there. Uh, he was very wealthy. He was very brilliant. He was very well educated. And he was a total unbeliever. And he decided to take all of this tremendous power and use it to smash the New Testament. Mm. And he decided the, most, the Achilles heel of the New Testament was the book of Acts because it was dealing with factual geographical, historical travels of Paul and other people, mm -hmm. and these could be refuted. So he sent out for uh, that area, and he started doing his studies. He started following what Luke said, and he spent years and years. He turned out a whole spate of books. But the, in the first one, he said that he had been astonished to find that Luke was astonishingly accurate, mm -hmm. that when he followed what he said, the evidence appeared. When he did, uh, anyway digressed from it, he couldn't find anything. And finally he came to conclude that, uh, that Luke had presented to us in the book of Acts a factual report that, uh, of which he could find no evidence whatsoever of any errors or contradictions in it. And William Ramsey uh, became a Christian <laughs> <laughs> to the consternation of the unbelieving world. <laughs> On, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground Amen. is sinking sand. Amen. Dr. Kennedy, I'm sure we've been talking to a lot of honest skeptics out there who, who really have struggled with this. Would you just take a minute more and let's invite them to make that decision right now? I'll be happy to do that. And dear viewer, listener, wherever you may be, the evidence is there. I'm so glad that I'm a Christian. One reason is because the evidence for it is overwhelming. And it has never been countermanded or contradicted. And those who will trust in Christ will so find that they have a faith which is built upon a solid rock. The rock of Christ, the rock of history, the rock of evidence, the rock of the Word of God. And the wonder of that is that not only is it absolutely true, but it is good news. It's not only news, but it's good news. And it's fantastic news that God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who is the creator of the universe, by whom all things were made, and without whom was not anything made, the scripture says, and that he came into this world. He took upon himself our guilt, which was imputed to him by the Father. And he went to the cross, bearing our sin, enduring in our place the very wrath of his Father, that we who trust in him might discover that the price has been paid, the penalty has been endured, and paradise has been purchased for all of those that will place their hopes in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But Christ not only had to die, the blood needed only not only to be shed, but it has to be re applied to us. There's a famous book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. The lamb had to be killed, but the blood had to be placed upon the lentils of the door.
Christ has died, but we must appropriate that to ourselves by faith, by inviting Christ to be the Lord and Savior of our lives, by trusting in Him and Him alone, and accepting freely and graciously the gift of life everlasting which Christ offers to you. If you don't know assuredly that you have eternal life, I urge you right now to invite Him into your heart. Pray with us right now this prayer, won't you? Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ divine, Son of God, divine Son of God, come into my heart, come into my heart and, cleanse me from all sin. and cleanse me from all sin. I accept you as Savior and Lord of my life. I, accept you as Savior, Lord of my life. I open my heart to thee. I repent of my sins, I of my sins. And, I and I now receive the gift of eternal life. I thank thee for it. I thank you. In thy name. In thy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, those of you who prayed that simple little prayer with Dr. Kennedy. I urge you to do the next thing that God's Word admonishes you to do, to simply move to that telephone and confess with your own mouth the Lord Jesus. That personal confession of faith is what seals the contract and the covenant and, and records your name even in the Lamb's Book of Eternal Life. Do that now. There will be a prayer partner there to pray with you, talk with you, read the Word to you. And if you need a Bible, need one we will send it to you with our love so just phone now and if you get a busy signal dial again in a few minutes and we know you'll get through always a joy to have you dr kennedy thank you for coming and spending the evening with us paul god bless, bless you i praise god for what you're doing keep it up thank dear you, friend sir. dear brother thank you let's tell dr kennedy thanks for <clears throat> blessing us tonight teaching us the word giving us a Steve Brock sings a song right now that could not be more appropriate. The church triumphant is alive and well. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And uh, I'll never forget a few uh, years ago, it's been too many years now, Steve, when we heard you on that great Church of God special sing this very song. The church triumphant is alive and well. Are we ready to sing it right now? We have to stretch a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a little testimony before you sing, Brother well, Steve. there's been a lot of life, and there's been a lot of <coughs> gray hair, <laughs> and there's been a lot of trial and tribulation, but the Lord has always been there, never fails to lead His children, never fails to take care of his children, never fails to manifest himself in the lives of believers who trust in him. I know today in whom I have believed, and I know that he's able to keep those things which I've committed unto him against that day. He never, at any moment of my life, has he ever failed to show me that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that brother is... Jesus Christ. God has always had a people. People who are blood-bought, born again, separated, free. People who are not for sale. People who are sound from center to circumference. People with consciences as steady as Gibraltar's mighty rock. God has always had a people. Stand for the right even if the heavens totter and the earth fades away. People that'll look the world straight in the eye and tell the truth. People with courage without shouting. Holiness conviction without denying it. People in whom the strength of everlasting life flows deep and flows strong. God has always had a people. Sure, some have misunderstood the church like Simon the magician. They have failed to realize that God's Holy Spirit is not a blessing to be bought, but an experience to be received. Others have aligned the church 
through their noisy unbelief, they've spread a false rumor to try to say that God is dead. I got news for you, friend. God is not dead. He is fulfilling prophecies. He is making ways. He is performing miracles. Sure, many today believe their doubts and doubt their beliefs and have succumbed spiritually. But many have stood the test and have come through strong faith in the Lord. Oh, my friend, on through the 20th century marches of mighty army. True, free people. God's people. They're the church. And they're alive. They're alive and well. So let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. Oh, we've settled. We made our choice. Let the anthems ring out songs of victory. Let them swell the church triumphant. Listen, child of God, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. John the Revelator said of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues stood before the throne with palms in their hands crying aloud, salvation to our God. Oh, my broken-hearted friend, you're not forgotten. The church is still alive. Young student, if you'll stand by the word of God, the God of the word will stand by you. Businessman, give that business to God. He'll bless it. He will prosper it through his power and his glory. Family of God, be filled with fresh faith. For the church is not going down. The church is going up. For we are alive tonight. We are alive. 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 And well. And well. And well. And well. Yeah. It's alive. The church is alive. You believe the church is alive? Shout amen. You believe you're on your way to heaven? Shout praise the Lord. All right, put your hands together. A happy day. Happy day. When Jesus watched. Oh, when he was, when my Jesus was, he was my sins all the way. Oh, happy day. It was a happy day. Come on, everybody now. Oh, a happy day. It was a happy day when Jesus was. my sins all the way oh happy day it was a happy day he taught me how how, how, how to watch and pray watch and pray my lord to live a job oh seeing every 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 It was a happy day. Come on, everybody, now help me sing. A happy day. Happy day. When Jesus was. I remember when he was. When my Jesus was. He was my sin. It was a happy day. Oh, I was way down in Lindell, Georgia. On my way to hell, but Jesus lifted me from my sin. He gave me 
It's beginning to sound like an encore to me, Steve. I, I think you better get another song up real quick. Okay, 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 okay. We'll have Steve come right back. I tell you what we may have to do tonight. We were planning to go two hours. We could go two and a half or three. How are your little seats doing over there? Are you, are you getting tired? Would you all like to stand up over there for a minute? Go ahead, stand up, everybody, and rest your little seats. Uh, the bleachers here are rather hard, folks, uh, so you at home, you uh, are blessed tonight, sitting on the couch there, wherever you are. So, uh, yes, stretch a little, rub a little bit, you're at home here, so just have, have, uh, take your liberty. And praise God, Mary, from Miami, her sins were just washed away tonight by the blood of the Lamb. Tony from Fort Lauderdale just received Christ. And I know many others will be phoning in who prayed with Dr. Kennedy. That was a wonderful... I'll tell you, I am so blessed every time Dr. Kennedy comes and shares his great wisdom with us. I want you to meet another wonderful brother in the Lord. Most of you know him. You can be seated whenever you want to. Uh, Jamie Buckingham. However, how many have ever read one of Jamie's books or Charisma Magazine or... <laughs> The last word. Uh, it's always a joy to have Jamie. He's one of the most widely read Christian writers and journalists of our generation. Award-winning magazine and newspaper columnist, has uh, served in editorial positions for Guidepost magazine, Logos Journal, and now writes a monthly um, column for Charisma, which I enjoy very much. I'm a lifetime member, you know, of Charisma magazine. <laughs> I sent you my. Your, you paid your hundred dollars. I back. paid my hundred dollars. Hundred dollars a year. A, a okay. few years ago, <laughs> and uh, so I I enjoy reading Last Word. In fact, I brought one of my favorites, free from the press. I don't know if we'll have time to read it all tonight, but I might read a few excerpts from it just for our journalist friends watching tonight. And uh, then Jamie has brought his brand new book. We, we will take a little time tonight, Jane. Would you read us oh, yeah. maybe one nothing, or two little nothing like short, reading out of your own book, short stories? Sure. <laughs> the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. <laughs> um, he's got a little story he'll tell us about that, and a very well-known dear friend of ours, it, it made a little miserable, <laughs> and we'll have a little fun at her expense tonight as well. Uh, let's see. Conservative estimates put the sales on Jamie's 44 books at 22 million. You must be rich. No, <laughs> they, they were all giveaways. <laughs> they were, I <Yeah>. see. <laughs> Sold at discounts. I see, I see. Familiar titles include, how many remember Run, Baby, Run? Shout It from the Housetops with Pat Robertson. Tramp for the Lord, Corey Tenboom. Daughter of Destiny. Uh, 
Catherine Kuhlman. Catherine Kuhlman. You got a little trouble on that one, yeah. I know. Yeah, just me. Jan had a little controversy. She didn't with that sue one. me like the no. other folks. No, we didn't <laughs> sue. Uh, he is described by his publisher as America's foremost Christian analyzer. Edits and publishes a twice monthly newsletter for leaders called the Buckingham Report. He was recently named editor in chief for Ministries Magazine from Palm Bay, Florida. Have you moved? I'm a native. You're a native? No. Where is Palm, Palm Bay? Palm Bay's a suburb of Melbourne. Melbourne, that's up north yeah. a little ways. That's just south of the real Kennedy Space Center. Yes, we understand. The genuine Kennedy Space Center. Tell Jamie Buckingham <laughs> welcome to praise tonight. How you doing, buddy? Good, friend. Um, I've read a lot of your writings, but I have to say that uh, this latest, The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Make You Miserable, is probably... I think it's going to be finally looked back as a catharsis for the, for the body of Christ. I mean, we have been through a lot of... Is I almost, I almost said a like bad word. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> a little bit, yes, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but I laughed and laughed, and I called Jan, and I told her, I, I love the one about the washing machine that eats your socks. I like uh, the one that makes fun of Francis Hunter. I like the, the one that... Weeks. The wigs. The wigs. The wig one is the funny. Yeah, that was, that was funny. You we'll want to talk about I wigs? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, let's find out what's happening. Uh, is, that is your latest book. That's I the understand. latest, yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a compilation. It's, a, uh, it's one of those things that I've always wanted to do. Uh, these are things I wanted to get off my chest. And it's, a, it's sheer spoof is all it is. It is just plain spoof. It's... Uh, it's Christian satire. No, I, I know. That, uh, and yet there are some very distinct spiritual Well, yeah. Messages sometimes the best way to get a message across is to get it across by chuckling at it. Yes. Uh, and some things are so, uh, are so potent that if you don't say it with a smile, that you get a fist in return. So sometimes yeah. that's the only way that you can say a thing is to, yeah. is to chuckle about it at the Which same time. Which one's your favorite there, James? Oh, I don't know. I like the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Don't ask My wife that. was the one who got me in trouble with this. She which, said, she said I, this is going to be your last book because you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to pay for the people who are going to sue you because of this one. <laughs> and, uh, which one was, was it Francis Hunter didn't like? Well, uh, Francis got... <laughs> bless her heart. Uh, she took exception to a couple. I, I wrote one in here uh, on which I call Barley Brown, which is a takeoff on a... Uh, medicine that my wife takes that Francis uh, kind of promotes in her ministry uh, called Barley Green, which... Uh, yes, I take Barley Green. You take Barley Green, too. Barley Green, yeah. yes. Barley Green is really, I determined, is a uh, is dried cow's cud. Oh, no! It's cow's cud that they take... Oh, no! And, uh, Are you and, and freeze dry it. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, it's good for you. I mean, it's really, you know... <laughs> I knew but, it was green. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and I just suggested that We've got a couple of cows in our backyard, in our pasture, and why just take the could? We've got the real stuff back there. We call it barley brown, which is thoroughly digested. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> Francis took great exception to that, and then she took great exception to the whole book and said that really the book should not be published, that the best thing I could do is to take it off the shelves because it's... Uh, so I wrote her a little note back, and I've known Frances for years, when she was fat and when she was skinny and, you know. In between. And, yeah, and in between. She's a, and she's a, she's a dear child of God. And I wrote her a little note back and said, well, Frances, at, at least I struck 50% off this thing. Obviously, the truth did not set you free, but it sure did make you miserable. And, uh, <laughs> Has and she, she written back? Yeah, yet? she wrote me back a little loving note and said, it's nice to be friends, you know, even when you're wrong. So, <laughs> so it's been good. Read us your favorite. Read us your favorite. They're little favorite? short stories. They're, they're a series of little short stories. Yeah, they're, they're chapters, and I just picked on everybody. These are things that, <laughs> these are things that we all say about one another. Uh, I always have a sneaking suspicion, can you really trust a man who wears a wig? <laughs> I mean, if he tries to deceive you with his appearance, what will he do with your money? Uh, or with your wife? Uh, and I've given thought to buying wigs. Every bald-headed man has. But then I wonder what would happen if I bent over and it fell off, or if I turned my head real fast and my hair stayed still. And so... Uh, 
this had grown out of the fact that somebody had nominated me for an organization called Bald Headed Men of America. And, <laughs> and so I also nominated six non wig wearing baldies California pastor Jack Hayford, <laughs> Korean pastor Yonggi Cho, musician Phil Driscoll, <laughs> evangelist Lester Summerall. <laughs> Charles Hunter, who is the backstage side of the Happy Hunter team, and then Bible teacher Tony Campolo, who likes to say to a crowd of young people, what you're looking at is not a bald head, but a solar, solar battery-operated high-powered sex machine. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite wig wearer is Marilyn Hickey's husband, Wally, <laughs> who pastors the Happy Church in Denver. Wally told me of an experience that he had while walking through the pitch black Hezekiah's Tunnel in Jerusalem. You've been there. Yes, I've this seen that. This quarter mile long waterway, which is carved through solid rock far below the city wall, channels the water from the Virgin Spring to the Pool of Siloam inside the city. And Wally and a small group from his church were wading single file through the narrow tunnel one afternoon, and the water was unusually high, about, about above the waist of the people, and each person was carrying a small candle. At one place, Wally banged his head on the low ceiling, dislodging his white-haired wig, which <laughs> fell into the flowing water. And before he could grab it, it had floated out of reach. <laughs> and suddenly there was a terrifying <laughs> scream echoing through the tunnel. It came from a woman downstream <laughs> who had looked down at the water in the light of her flickering candle to <laughs> see what it was that had brushed against her bosom. <laughs> and. So, Seeing the white wig swimming around her body, she went bonkers. <laughs> Pandemonium broke loose in the dark tunnel as the panic spread to others standing in single file in flowing water. Cries of snake, rats, and demons echoed <laughs> off the ancient wall. <laughs> and Wally finally had to outshout everyone and holler, it's just my wig. <laughs> By that time, the wig was far downstream, and the terrified people finally made their way out of the tunnel into the welcome sunlight where they found Wally's wig floating serenely in the pool of Siloam. <laughs> One wag later remarked it was a good thing this took place in the 20th century rather than in Jesus' day. If the blind man Jesus had sent to the pool of Siloam to wash the mud from his eyes had received his sight and suddenly seen that white wig floating in the water, he probably would have gone blind again. <laughs> Anyway, thank God for Wally Hickey, who doesn't seem to mind. Somehow being in the company of distinguished baldies, wigged or not, makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Wally hadn't written me yet. I, 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 he will I, now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he will after tonight. He, he knew better than to tell me the story. He didn't tell me it was confident. He just told me the story. That was all. Oh, this is... So I, if you have anything you'd like to tell me, uh, Paul, why we've got a sequel coming up sooner or later. Why well, <laughs> fortunately, I did not make it into your book anywhere. No, because my friends didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I see. laughs> uh, some of the uh, titles of these little short stories is uh, uh, My Washing Machine Has a Demon, yes. uh, Unsystematic Theology, Things That Go Squish in the Night, Acts of God, thank God for extremists. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, who turned up the pressure? <laughs> Auctioning off the family treasure. The tidal waves are coming in. That one is a scream. Uh, the Lord is just, the Lord is fair. He gave some brains and others hair. <laughs> uh, pastoral ministry, or you can fool most of the folks most of the time. <laughs> Uh, all God's chillin' got shoes, the Jesus look, and on and on and on. It's just really a delightful little... What, what was the inspiration behind this? I mean... Uh, oh, stuff you, at you home primarily. I'll read you know, stuff with my children and with my wife. And I finally realized that uh, we've been through a tough year. We've been through a tough two years. We really have. The, the kingdom of God has been through a tough two years. Mm -hmm. And when things get as bad as they have been, and everybody's trying to straighten it out. And after a while, you begin to realize you can't straighten out a mess like this. The best you can do is to sit back and, and let God straighten it out. I think it was Garrison Keillor, who is, I think, one of the real prophets of the day, uh, Garrison Keillor of Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, yes. who stated that if God is God, uh, then life is a comedy. And he was talking comedy in the Shakespearean sense, not in the joke sense. But in the Shakespearean sense, where it's either comedy or tragedy, and tragedy, 
uh, things end on a very sour note. In comedy, all's well that ends well. Okay. And uh, Steve was saying just a few minutes ago about the church triumphant. It's been through, the church has been through hell. It's been to hell and back, but the church is triumphant. And, Amen. and, and so why not laugh? Why not sit back and kind of chuckle? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a story in there about these various movements that we have been through. Oh, yes, what is that yes. One? Oh, what yes. Is that one? Let me read that let, one. Uh, uh, which one I that? really enjoyed that. I, you can uh, find it quickly. Yeah, here, I'll let you pick it up, <coughs> Paul. But, uh, well, here it starts here on page 16 there, and that, uh, it's right at the very beginning. Ah, yes. Let, uh, let me read this one. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this one. It is so true. A long time ago, I was editor, speaking of Jamie now, of the now defunct Logos Journal magazine. In fact, a lot of magazines I once edited have since defuncted. <laughs> the, the charismatic movement was going through one of its systematic annual crises of the time. Everyone's cage was being rattled by something called the discipleship movement. You remember that a few years ago? In fact, it kind of started right oh, down yeah, here in South started, Florida. Yeah, we were right in the heart of it. <clears throat> yeah. A lot of people were angry with each other. Pat Robertson had gone on television and equated Bible teachers Bob Mumford and Charles Simpsons with occult leader Jim Jones, who had just led a bunch of folks to commit suicide by drinking poison Kool-Aid. A California-based organization known as the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship had officially banned anyone remotely connected with shepherding from speaking in their meetings. In fact, they had even banned me simply because I happened to live in the, in the same state of Florida with the California people who had heard um, was somewhere near Fort Lauderdale where all the shepherds lived. Catherine Kuhlman, who had a wonderful healing ministry, was convinced the discipleship movement was a spreading epidemic that needed healing. She went on television and called Bible teacher Derek Prince a false prophet, <clears throat> which is something like being a spiritual typhoid Mary. <laughs> it was an interesting time in the kingdom. Somehow I wound up as chairman of one of the reconciliation committees that popped up like toadstools in a barnyard after a rainy night. One or more, or one of our more infamous meetings was held in a schoolhouse outside Minneapolis. After two days of hearing witnesses from both sides of the controversy, everybody who was anybody was there, <laughs> An Episcopal priest, whom many called the father of the charismatic movement, got so angry he threw his Bible on the floor, shouting that he was tired of listening to blasphemy, he stomped out of a door, slamming it behind him. We all sat in stunned silence. This was one of our most respected leaders. Then we heard all this noise behind the door. It sounded like buckets being overturned on the floor and sticks pounding against the wall. Moments later, the door opened. There stood the respected cleric, his red face contrasting sharply with his white turnaround collar. Unfamiliar with the building, it seemed he had stormed into a broom closet and gotten <laughs> tangled up <laughs> with the buffet buckets and mops. <laughs> yes. No trouble back here. No trouble there. I went back home after the meeting. We never did settle anything and wrote a James Thurber column in the Logos Journal, which uh, guaranteed its defunctness. <laughs> Thurber, I recalled, had once written a story entitled The Day the Dam Broke. It started out with a man dashing through a little town shouting, Run for your lives, the dam has burst. The entire town fled in panic. Women and nursing children ran awkwardly down the street. A man <laughs> leaped from his barber's chair, lathered on his face, and a blue and white striped apron still around his neck. <laughs> to join the panic-stricken mob heading for high ground. Houses and stores emptied in an every-man-for-himself stampede. Finally, panting and out of breath, one fat man collapsed alongside the road. Go on, he motioned to the people fleeing past him. I'll just have to drown in the flood. But as he sat there trying to catch his breath, a thought came to him. What dam? There isn't any dam within a hundred miles. <laughs> Eventually, Thurber said, everyone came to the same conclusion and returned <laughs> sheepishly to their town. The interesting thing was they never mentioned the incident again. <laughs> it was as though the panic had never happened. Well, I suggested in my editorial that a sane approach to the discipleship movement or any other movement would be for the leaders to get together, laugh at each other over and at themselves, and wait it out. This, too, will pass, I concluded. 
That made everyone angry, and they defuncted the magazine. <laughs> of course, the editorial I wrote entitled The Whippin' Poofs probably helped finish <laughs> us off. That was the one where I likened the leaders of the shepherding movement to the Yale seniors who raised their beer mugs down at Maury's and sang, We are poor little sheep who have gone astray. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> that did it. Yeah, that, that finished <laughs> that it did all. It. Tell me you didn't write it. Bob Mumford pleaded with me, but I had. A few years later, right on course, the discipleship movement did dissolve. About that same time, Catherine Kuhlman went on to heaven and discovered a lot of folks were there because the shepherds had pointed the way. <laughs> Pat Robertson resigned from television and ran for president, which was really funny. The Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship sent an investigator to Florida and discovered that Fort Lauderdale was actually populated by Jews and Canadians, <laughs> not shepherds. <laughs> In fact, they couldn't find a single member of the old discipleship movement. All the Bible teachers had moved to Alabama and California and left me to run Florida the way it should be run. Like the folks in Thurber's parable, everyone had sneaked back into town and was going about business as usual. What panic, they asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. If we could only settle all of our problems with a little humor like that, there would be a lot less feuding and fighting. If we just give a little more time, I think we could settle them. Yeah. God has a way of working these things out, Paul. Yeah. And we're the ones who get uptight. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I stopped being a defender of the faith a long time ago. I figured that the Holy Spirit can defend it a lot better than I can. In fact, I have a little note in the front of my Bible that says, Jamie, you can't defend the Holy Spirit and reveal him at the same time. Hmm. And it seems that my task is to reveal, not to defend. But, Jamie, the, where is that line then? I mean, obviously, we are to contend earnestly for the faith. And if, if we see someone that we sincerely and really believe is, is in error or is over in a little bit of heresy or whatever, what, what, what should we do then? Should we just leave him alone? Oh, no, I think never? God sends along enough people uh, who will straighten that guy out. Uh, the problem is if we all try to straighten him out, that he's more crooked when we finish with him than he should be to start with. And, and so I think inside the body of Christ, we have this marvelous balance of folks who straighten folks out and of folks who laugh at it and of folks who just go merrily on their way as though there's no problem at all. That's what makes up the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so instead of me jumping on the guys who are angry, I need to, I need to chuckle with them a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. If I just could learn to respect the gifts that everybody else has and to let those gifts function and operate inside the body. So I think there is a place. Certainly there's a place. Uh, but, you know, but, but how are we to know that, you know, Pat Robertson denouncing this wasn't his gift operating at that time to bring something that was out of order into order? Well, I think it mm -hmm. probably was. I think, but if everybody had taken Pat Robertson's stance, we'd have gone into book burning and, uh, mm. and witch hunting, and before long, you would have been dunked in a <laughs> pond uh, someplace and held under until you recanted. And, uh, yes, yes. Uh, so there, there, there needs to be a, a, a person someplace mm -hmm. who will staunchly defend the faith. <laughs> You, you wrote a, one of your columns on the heresy hunters <laughs> ride again. <laughs> Did you get some reaction on that? Oh, listen, Paul, I, I have tried to be nice to people since that thing, and uh, <laughs> they, they keep coming back to me. I mean, the heresy hunter column was just one of the worst things that's happened to me in a long time because all the heresy hunters jumped on me. <laughs> <laughs> I helped that a little because I, oh, I know the, you read, read the whole the thing on, on the air. air. And, then they, then they really jumped on me. I mean, the folks who didn't read the magazine uh, heard you. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just read. This is very short. Steve, you ready to sing another song or two? We'll have a little concert. I promised that we'd have a little encore here, so I haven't forgotten my promise, folks. But uh, this is only one page, and it is Jamie's column in Charisma Magazine, April 88 just a year ago, and he entitled it Free From the Press. Let me read. This is my favorite. The morning after the Swaggart scandal broke, I woke to the inner words, Beware of the tumblebugs. It's been a long time since I thought of tumblebugs. Lying in bed, I remembered kneeling as a child in our barnyard watching those little beetles at work. 
A tumble bug finds a pile of manure. With his front claws, he pulls out a small amount, mixes it liberally with beetle spit, works it into a ball, then rolls it across the barnyard in front of him, pushing it with his nose. Remember them? Anybody from the farm over there? <clears throat> As I look out over the kingdom, I realize God has given his church a huge dose of laxative. The secular media, the tumble bugs of society, smelling the results of God's purgative, have rushed out from under the rocks. They're not looking for the hand of God, much less the face of God. They're not even interested in the type of psychic, uh, physic, in the type of physic administered by the Holy Spirit to cleanse and purify His church. All they are nosing for is expelled waste. Once found, and God's people never have been good at digging latrines, they roll it into a neat little TV spot and serve it up on the 6 o'clock news. The tragedy is we bite into it. No one is a stronger proponent of freedom of the press than I, but it is truth which makes us free, not twisted, slanted, one-sided, incomplete facts. Such stories put us more in bondage than any journalistic censorship imposed by government regulations. A free press in the hands of irresponsible journalists is as dangerous as a vindictive man who shouts fire in a public theater. The journalists whose primary intent is to catch people in wrongdoing or who edit film to create the impression of wrongdoing are instruments of the devil. Why does the press continually ask questions of Pat Robertson which set him up to look like a Pentecostal buffoon? Remember what the media did to former Secretary of Interior James Watt? Once the newspapers discovered he believed in the return of Christ, they twisted it to mean Watt felt it was okay to destroy our natural resources since the world would be burned up when Jesus returned anyway, the exact opposite of what the secretary believed. Following my brief foray into the world of the secular media during the PTL scandal, I quickly realized that no good can come from Christians being interviewed on programs such as Larry King Live, Nightline, or 60 Minutes. Yet following the Swaggart scandal, I saw publicity hunting preachers by the score, drooling to have their pious faces making nonsensical statements on the tube. Please, please, I said to my friends, don't go on public TV. Your words will be twisted. Let God do His work without your opinions or interference. But it's hard to say no when ABC is on the phone saying the world is waiting for your wisdom. When will we realize the world does not understand our terminology, our values, our commitment to walk to the sound of a different drummer? Yet we go on public TV and toss out terms even we don't fully understand, terms such as repentance, forgiveness, and discipline. Please, my brothers, shut up and stay home. Talk theology among yourselves if you go on public TV, talk about God's love. Remember, dear reader, today's free press is not really free. The facts, especially slanted facts, do not make us free. Only the truth makes us free. Until the press begins reporting what God is doing rather than what man is doing or man's angry or confused reactions to what God is doing, it's never qualified to claim uh, to, claim to be free. Why didn't the free press headline Jimmy Swaggart's outstanding overseas crusades, the largest in history, as well as his sin? Why doesn't the free press in their 90 seconds a night report on the problems in Israel also remind us that the Koran promises Muslims who kill Jews and Christians a place in heaven? And would you expect to read the papers, in the papers, any account of spiritual changes Jim and Tammy Baker might have undergone, undergone since their fall? Like tumblebugs, the media is only interested in something that stinks. In Jan a January survey of the Anti-Defamation League found that 51% of American Jews thought Israel was responding too harshly to the Palestinian rioters. Where did the ADL, Israel's greatest American friend, get its information? from the slanted news served up by the TV tumblebugs. A U.S. News and World Report survey says half the country 
thinks Pat Robertson is a religious weirdo who scares people. Where does America get its information on Robertson's theology? From the media tumblebugs. On the basis of a single column in USA Today telling us Jimmy Swaggart is a porn addict or a horrible picture of Jim and Tammy in the National Enquirer, we draw mind-shutting conclusions. Jesus did not tell Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for Dan Rather has revealed this unto you. He said his church was to be built on knowledge from God. Since media revelation is earthly, I'll have to look elsewhere to find what God is saying. It's time for Christians to turn off their TV sets and open their Bibles. Where else can you find a true word on Israel, politics, or how to treat a fallen preacher? My favorite. Now, do you want to tell us again why you went on TV later on yeah. after you wrote this Like column? the very next month, and I wound up on Geraldo <laughs> Rivera's show. <laughs> I love to simply, I simply, him on this. Yeah, yeah, simply because he, you know, I should, I should have known better than to believe a liar, um, <laughs> but promised me that what they wanted to do was to talk about, uh, they wanted to talk about restitution in the kingdom of God and reconciliation in the kingdom of God. And I said, I'm willing to talk about that on, on public television. Mm -hmm. I think those are great themes that the whole world wants to know about. And so I went up there and I did not realize until after I got on the platform, Paul, I mean, sitting there in the studio, and they, they ran that thing in, in uh, seven segments, and the whole first segment, which was six minutes long, I guess, uh, that they cranked up was, was a videotape of Jimmy Swaggart. Mm. And I did not realize that they wanted to talk about Jimmy Swaggart. I thought they had told me they wanted to talk about man's relationship with God. I found out they wanted to talk about Jimmy Swaggart. The tumblebugs all over again. And there I was sitting there on the platform with my face red, and I, I said, the thing for me to do is to get up and just walk off the platform and out of the studio. And then I, a very practical matter, where do I go after I get through that door? I mean, they have, <laughs> here I am in the heart of New York City. They've brought me from the hotel to the studio in a limo. There's a big audience out there. And what am I going to do? I'm just going to walk out there and stand out there on the curb, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so I called the producer over, the floor producer, and said, listen, I, I, I can't be a part of this. And she said, you've got to be a part of it. She said, this is what you're up here for, is to talk about this. I said, I am not going to talk about Jimmy Swaggart on public television. You guys are doing all you want to with that. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm here uh, not as part of the whole buzzard gang to pick at a carcass. Hmm. Uh, my job is to, is to uphold. So they just played off of me, that's all. I sat mm -hmm. there the whole program mm -hmm. and uh, made a closing statement when they finally gave the camera back to me. And I, and I simply said that. I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pick at the carcass of my brother, and that's the reason I haven't said anything. Good for you. you. Good for you. Bless you. <laughs> All right, let's sing a song or two, and then we'll have a, uh, another little uh, segment from the book and anything else we wanna talk about tonight. It's kind of fun to get Jamie here Amen. once in a while. Amen. Just have a nice evening together. You might suggest that folks get to their phones and yes. bring in all of their prayer requests. Those of you that found Jesus as your Savior, we want to send you a Bible and a new birth certificate and just a little Bible study on what's happened in your life now that you found Jesus. And it's wonderful. We've had over 100,000 people graduate from the little Bible school. That little partners just sit at home and grade and send it back to you. And you send it back and back and back. You actually get a little certificate of I've been born again, what's happened now, how to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how to be a witness, and it's two or three little lessons, and it's just a wonderful little Bible study course, and it's yours free. We've had so many prisoners that have taken it, so many young people, yes. and it's wonderful. That's yours free, and a Bible if you don't have one. So you just call us right now, and those of you that have a need in your life, We'd like to remember you in our prayer a little later, so you call right now. We'll be talking to you. 
Talking Amen. to Jesus about your problem. Okay, Steve Brock. A couple of songs. Going to do a little mini concert for us? All right. In the upper room and leaving on my mind. Oh, Let's wonderful. sing it with him. Too good. On the day of Pentecost, the promise of the Lord came down. The Spirit of the Lord came in with power. Peter then began to preach. Three thousand souls he did reach. Authority was given him that very hour. In the upper room, in the upper room, oh, Jesus met me in the upper room. And like the saints of old, his power has made me bold. Oh, I'm so glad I've been in the upper room. Listen now. Why should we take second best? Why we've got the power to stand the test? We are more than conquerors through Christ our Lord. In the power of his might, the old enemy must take his flight. We must come together now in one accord. The upper room, in the upper room, oh Jesus, he met me in the upper room, and like saints of old, his power has made me bold, oh, I'm so glad I've been in the upper room, one more time, in the upper room. In the upper room, oh, Jesus, he met me in the upper room. I like the saints of old, his power has made me bold. Oh, I'm so glad I've been, I'm so glad I've been, I'm so glad I've been in the upper room. been in the upper room. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glad I've been in that upper room. Because of that upper room, I'm on my way to heaven and Jesus Christ is alive in my heart and life. Be all right with me if I went to heaven right now. Great song. The old house. I'm living in his needing repair. The windows and the shutters are letting in the cold, cold air. Say to myself, I'm Fix them. When I can find the time, all I've got is leaving, leaving on my mind. And lately, all I've got. That's all I think about, preach about, most of the time, how that soon and very soon I'm gonna leave this old troubled world, 
my old nagging pain behind. Hallelujah. Lately, I'm not leaving. Leave it all. Praise the Lord. I guess I should be looking for a better place to live. Oh, but I, I don't seem to get excited anymore about this old world and what it can be. I couldn't care less if I could buy Miami, Florida for a solitary time for what in the world would I do with Miami, Florida I've got leaving on my mind and lately all I've got That's all I think about Most of the time How that soon And very soon I'm gonna leave this old troubled world This old nagging pain behind Lately I've got leaving Leave it on my mind, tell you where I'm going. Head it home. I'm headed home. Nothing, nothing in this world's gonna turn me right. about it all the time I got leaving on my mind beautiful 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 Steve Brock Lord Lord I love those songs and I love the way Steve sings them I think he's just about one of the greatest gospel singers in the whole wide world. And, uh, Steve, I don't remember the dates. Maybe you do, but we're coming to Cincinnati now real soon. And uh, I'll just give you all a little tip-off up there in the great tri-state area. Uh, uh, let's see. Cincinnati, Dayton, Richmond, Indiana, that whole tri-state area. We're coming to see you, and we're going to have two great nights of live praise the Lord. <clears throat> but do you know what else we're going to do? We're going to have a groundbreaking. And uh, Brother and Sister Carol, a beautiful couple up there, have donated a choice, I think two acres, isn't it, of property right there on I... Highway, Highway 63, right off Interstate 75. Interstate 75 that goes between Cincinnati and Dayton, and just right there in the little town of... Monroe, right there on Highway 63. I should let you tell this, Steve. That's his neck of the woods. I mean, he lives up there in Hamilton. It's the 18th and 19th of May. It, the 19th of May. That'd be a Thursday and a Friday. We're going to be there for two great nights, I believe. 
Now, don't hold me to this. Sister Program Director, can't you tell? Are we going to Tim Sheets Church or are we going to Tri County know. Assembly? I don't know. I'm sorry. But anyhow, we'll let you know as we get a little closer to it. And uh, then on, I guess, we ought to go out Saturday morning, which would be the 20th then, wouldn't it? And we're going to turn some dirt over and we're going to lay the foundation just right away for your brand new television studio for Channel 43. Cincinnati, Dayton, Richmond, Indiana. It's going to be wonderful. We'll be able to have lots more good programming and live praise the Lord and just lots of good things happening Amen. up there. Wonderful. Shall we have a little yes, word of prayer before we have a final uh, story or two and a song? She's, here's someone, honey, that just really caught my eye as I was reading through the Chris. Someone called in from right here in Fort Lauderdale and said she is a Christian, but... All that's on her mind is that she just wants to die, just wants to commit suicide. Mm. And it's calling and asking for prayer and for someone to please help her. Here's someone else, courage uh, in, in a discouraging time and um, just needs a miracle. Here's someone that is um, having a tremendous drinking problem. And... Um, Someone that wants the Lord's blessing in their life, wants to know more of the Word. So many have um, cancer, and um, here's someone has a very, what is that? Someone has run away, and just, um, here's a little 10 year old that has cut her finger uh, off. And the parents have just taken her to the hospital, and they're asking for oh, prayer Jesus. in that situation. So there's some pretty serious things right urgent, now. That's urgent coming. needs. How many in this room have a real urgent need that only the Lord can undertake for? All of us, I sure am sure, have those kinds of needs. Isn't it wonderful to know that you have a great, big, beautiful family called the body of Christ? And isn't it wonderful we can be linked together with this great communication tool called television so that we can bear one another's burdens, pray for one another, uh, agree with each other for the answers to these many needs. Jamie, just lift these, would you, to the Lord in prayer and lead us in our prayer time, please. You know, Paul, we get so tied up in what's happening right here on earth that we forget that we're just a speck in this marvelous thing called eternity. That thing Jan was talking about earlier, that the Lamb of God has already paid the price of that, and we don't have to bear those burdens. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you tonight for what, for what your Son has already done, that he became our Passover, and that on this Passover night, we thank you for your marvelous sacrifice, your voluntary sacrifice, that nobody took your life, that you laid it down for us. And so for all of these here, all these represented on these little blue pieces of paper who have called in and, and the thousands of others who haven't even had the courage to call in but are watching right now, you do it, Spirit of God. You come into their lives right now. We can love and we can care, but only you can pull back the curtain and allow them to see your son, Jesus. Amen. So I ask you to do that for this one who's so desperate that life is, holds no meaning, for the children that are hurting, for those who are hungry, for those who are without jobs, for those who are sick, for all of these in desperate need. Put your arm around them and reveal your son, Jesus, O Spirit of God, and we'll give you glory and praise for it, Father, in his name. Amen. 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 Everybody said, Amen. 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 You know, what have we got, about 15 minutes or so? This might be an idea for one of your, one of your columns, The Last Word, uh, Jamie. I don't know, just lately, there's been such an, an overwhelming sense of the reality of, of these wonderful things that, that we've been taught from children, the truths of God's Word. You know, I, I'm, I'm 
55 years old, and, and I'm able now to look back on a lot of, humanly speaking, quite a lot of history. When you're a young person looking forward, you just kind of take it because mom and dad says this is the way it is or it's true because it's in the Bible or it's this or that because we take other people's word for it, you know. But I, I don't know if I can even hardly express what, I, what I'm really feeling inside, but you reach a point finally in life where you look back and, and, and almost suddenly it just kind of overwhelms you. Man, this thing really is real. It really is true. All that I've been taught from a child, you know, is really, honestly, really the truth. It, it really is. And I don't know. I, I just lately, it seems, in my own life and experience, it's, it's just been that, I don't know, as we were reading earlier tonight, as Jan was reading the, about the Passover and, and the, just such a, a love for the Lord just kind of overwhelmed me and, and the truth of His precious blood and His redemption. And on this eve of Passover, of course, a very beautiful and appropriate time to think out, uh, about it. But I don't know. You, you probably, you're, you're the literary guy. You could probably take this. You know, I've, 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 I've just come back from Israel this last week. Um, Paul, we, I was there with a, with a camera crew. We, we were there for three weeks, and we, I've, I've produced, written and produced uh, 50 uh, six-minute uh, video devotionals to be used for Catholics and Episcopalians during Lent of next year. And the impetus for this was a couple of Episcopal bishops who came to me and said, there is a new move of God among Catholics and Episcopalians. He's not talking about the, the charismatic. He's simply talking about people in the Catholic Church and in the Episcopal Church who for years have, have read these truths in their prayer book primarily mm -hmm. and have said, something's happening that the Word of God that they've been reading Sunday after Sunday after Sunday is taking root mm. in the lives of these people. Now, it's not with the flourish that so many of us are accustomed to. And it was on the basis of that he asked me if I'd go to Israel and, and cut these videotapes to be used next year during Lent because he said what's happened is we've discovered that, that people are beginning to take Lent seriously. They're, they're moving from that period from Ash Wednesday up to Easter and they are looking forward with a new celebration to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And, and where they might not sit down and read a devotional book, they will plug in a VCR and for six minutes a day mm -hmm. gather their family around and watch a devotion. And, and so one of the Catholic bishops came to me and said, the only thing I ask of you, if you're going to do it on location, use the Bible. He says, it's got to be done mm -hmm. with the Scripture because that's the only thing that will bring life. And I thought here, from a whole different perspective, coming at it from the liturgical perspective, are these people who are saying, I want to know more about God. I'm hungry for the truths that we've learned from childhood. Mm -hmm. Now, for them to become life in our lives. Something is happening, Jamie. It really is. Something really different. You know, I mean, I've been through most, you know, all the renewals too and the next wave and all of this, but something different. Is, is really happening within, within the body of Christ. It, it really is. Well, we've had a wonderful evening. <laughs> Madam, do you have a final word or thought or a little you segment you might <laughs> like to read? <laughs> do you have a favorite read. section? of? Well, I think this has happened to all the ministers. Let me just say, okay. for those flippers, buyers that don't know, this is Jamie Buckingham, and uh, he's written a new book called The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Make You Miserable. And uh, I love that title. Do you like this one? Please close your head. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. This Go, to it. Go to it. This <laughs> is wonderful. Please close your heads, and all of you that have ever been in front of a congregation will relate to this one. Well, it finally happened. It was on the platform during the early... S I was on the platform during the early service that Sunday morning. Although we had a guest speaker, I was directing the service. Our church soloist, Jimmy Smith, was singing from the piano. It was powerful, move of God. He was singing, I will pour water on him that is thirsty. As he finished, I turned to the guest minister, who was seated beside me. 
I'm going to lead the prayer before you preach, I whispered. He nodded. I picked up the wireless microphone and walked to the pulpit just as the music finished. Please bow your heads and close your eyes, I said. Jimmy caught the mood and continued to play softly. I talked for a moment about the water of the Holy Spirit that softens the parched earth of our lives. I asked the people to let him come into their lives. Jimmy sang another stanza, and some of the people slipped to their knees. I closed by asking them to receive the seed of the word which the preacher was about to sow into their lives. It was good stuff. Even I was amazed at how good God can do it when I get out of the way. After the service, the guest speaker commented, That was great. I wish you could repeat it just the same way at the second service. I swelled a little. It was a good word. Fresh, spontaneous. I nodded. If a thing is good for one group, why not for all? In the second service before a much larger crowd, Jimmy sang the same song, but something was different. The people were not responding as the first group had, but my course was set. Once again, I picked up the microphone and stepped to the pulpit. With solemn drama, I called the people to prayer. I closed my eyes. My head bowed. I waited piously through the dramatic pause. Instead of the expected silence, however, I heard laughter. It started in the side section where my wife and grown children were sitting. It rippled across the congregation like dry leaves before the wind, growing louder and louder. Mm -hmm. I stood there, puffed up and dumb, wondering what was happening. Was something going on that was funny I couldn't see because I had my eyes closed? I opened my eyes and immediately squeezed them shut. The people were laughing so hard they were crying. Then in that horrifying way a person knows, I knew they were laughing at me. Surely it wasn't my zipper. <laughs> Only then did I recall what I had said. It ran through my thoughts like a tape replay. I had said, please bow your eyes and close your heads. <laughs> I love it when it happens to other stuffed shirts, but now it was my time. Memories like rabbits in front of hounds raced wildly across my mind. I remember the time I came to the platform to officiate in a formal wedding. I had just come out of the bathroom and didn't realize until I was in front of all those people that stuck to the toe of my shoe and trailing behind was an eight-foot stream of toilet paper. <laughs> I remember the time I looked down in the middle of my sermon and saw, yes, my pants were unzipped, but my shirt tail was sticking out like a flag waving in the wind. <laughs> I remember the time I put my hand on the casket in front of the church and the flimsy stand I was on gave way. <laughs> completely gave way. Then I remembered that Easter morning baptismal mm. service some years ago. The baptistry was high above the choir loft. My plan was to baptize at the beginning of the service, then rush to the platform during the hymn so I could preach. That morning I wore my new waders, huge rubber boots that came up to my chest, held in place by suspenders. The last person to be baptized was an <clears throat> ample woman. I mean ample as in enormous. And when I lowered her beneath the surface, she displaced far more water than I had anticipated. The overflow rushed into my waders, filling them to the brim. <laughs> When the woman came up, the water went down, leaving me standing <laughs> in 400 pounds of water-filled boots. I was rooted to the bottom of the baptistry, <laughs> and I couldn't move. I finally had to lower my suspenders. <laughs> 
and crawl out of the boots in front of the entire Easter congregation. Yes, in my underwear. <laughs> The very next week, seven days too late, the Ladies' Missionary Society installed a draw curtain in the baptistry. All this ran through my mind as I realized I've been here before. I knew if I tried to correct my mistake, it would get worse. But what do you do? The one thing I didn't want to do was laugh. I wanted to be like Elijah and suddenly disappear in a whirlwind, never to be seen again. But the more I thought of what had just happened, the funnier it seemed. Here's a solemn, pious stuff shirt who comes strutting to the pulpit with ministerial pomp, accomplished, accompanied by soft music, saying, please bow your eyes and close your heads. I began to giggle. The congregation howled. They were now laughing so hard people were holding their stomachs. Gradually, I realized what had happened. What God had done in the early service, I had tried to duplicate on my own strength. God, who enjoys a good laugh too, figured since I was going to take the credit, he might as well let me do it in a big way. My way always is to stick my foot in my mouth. When you want the people to notice you, God usually says, be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. <laughs> Jamie Buckingham, one of your best, Jamie. That's great. I've enjoyed it very much, and I know many, many more will too. Thanks for being our guest tonight. Good we've to be enjoyed here, Paul. it very much. Did you all enjoy Jamie and some of the fun we've had with his new book tonight? Many of you will want to pick it up. It's out on the bookstores yes, everywhere, isn't it? Yes, in, in all the bookstores, yeah. Great. It's doing very well, by the Tell way. Stephen Strang, our good buddy, hello for us when you go back, uh, owner of Charisma, Christian Life, and we'll see you all again real soon. We've got just time to say goodnight with a song. How about it, Steve Brock? The song amen. says, come on, Amen Corner. This is your part. Amen. 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 Everybody now, listen to my story. Story about Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. See the little baby wrapped in a manger. Christmas morning, amen. See him by the seashore. Talking to the fishermen, sing it with me. Making them disciples, amen, amen. Riding in Jerusalem, waving palm branches in power and splendor, amen. Amen. See him in the garden. Can you see him? He's talking to the Father in great sorrow. He was in great sorrow. Sweat became as great drops of blood. Then they led him before Pilate. Pilate didn't know what to do with him, so he gave him to the people and the soldiers, and they crucified him, they buried him. But he rose on Easter morning, amen, amen, I said glory, TVN has a worldwide ministry. We need to love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today, praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TVN, P.O. Box 23517, Vancouver AMF, Vancouver, British Columbia, B7B, 1W2. 
If you would like to contact guests or musicians for their tapes, books, or albums, please write us at TBN and we'll forward your correspondence. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout the United States of America.